Good morning, everybody. It's always a joy to be back at Phillips. I graduated in 2011, and it feels like it was just yesterday. Every time I walk in this building, I am reminded of the experiences I felt here and the transformation that occurred in my life and seeing faces of former classmates um, and professors. So thank you for having me this morning. You know, I, I am now leading an ecumenical organization that works with approximately 17 different Christian denominations, but we also have an active interfaith presence. I never imagined that I would be in a position of having this broad ministry. Coming here, I entered seminary not knowing what that would look like for me in the end. I just knew this was where I was supposed to be. I would let God handle the rest, and that seems to be going okay at times. <laughs> but what this particular call has brought for me is experiences in all kinds of churches. Not just my particular denomination, but multiple denominations and multiple congregations within those denominations. I feel like that's generally very unique. It's something that I don't take for granted. But it does put me in a different viewpoint. I feel like I exist at a 10,000 foot level, looking at the church as a whole across the spectrums. And so from that lens, I come to you this morning, but I also come reflecting on PTS. And like many of you, I'm sure that there are quotes that you garner from your professors that you then carry with you throughout your life in ministry. And I want to share a few of those with you today um, that I received. When I entered my introduction to preaching class, I was terrified. I didn't want any part of preaching, but my closest friends in seminary were taking it that semester. And I figured if I'm going to have to stand in front of my classmates and preach, I want it to be people who are gracious. So the very first day of introduction to preaching, our professor said to us, to engage in the act of preaching means the willingness to be crucified weekly. That wasn't a helpful quote to hear on day one <laughs> of introduction to preaching. But I have since come to fully understand the weight of what that means and have been blown away by that professor and all she has done for she is now the first female president of this seminary. Nancy was vital. She taught us in ways that emphasized bravery. Our voice. Our voice is to be brave in all moments. The next quote came from an introduction to CPE course. It was taught by John Thomas. He told us that when we walk into a room, we bring with us the holy. No wonder we have to be brave. For in our steps, in our very existence, we carry with us what is holy. And if we shy away from being brave, what does that mean for the nature of God? This morning's scripture doesn't shy away from what Jesus really is trying to say, for he bluntly tells the disciples, in order to follow me, you must lose everything that you are holding on to. These worldly desires, even to the point of what the world expects of you, that is to be left behind. That's hard. How can we live in a world but be apart from it, if not for bravery? Earlier in Matthew, Jesus offers another quote that I love in a, in a text that mirrors this one. In chapter 10, he says, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. 
That text, although used and quoted in ways that are questionable, Jesus is saying, I have not come to just mold into the world as you see fit. I have not come to placate the world around me. I've come to upend what's happening, to bring justice, and that's not friendly. So the expectation is to let go of the world around us. So let's, let's think for a minute about the world around us. Today, right now, what does the world look like? I think it looks pretty busy. But maybe that's because the world has taught us that value is placed in our busyness. To be busy means that you have value. It means you're doing something important, maybe. So we strive for busy. People are busier than ever before. We live in an on-demand world. We live in a world of Netflix and Postmates, of on-demand movies and rentals. The whole world exists at the click of a button, a text with the hands, and we can have whatever we want whenever we want it that will appease us. In no other way, our society now is more polarized than ever. And maybe, just maybe, that is because the world exists in such a way that we can access what makes us happy so easily and isolate ourselves from discomfort so easily. Think about social media. The world of social media has exploded since probably 2004 when it began. That's not that long to become such a cultural phenomenon, a phenomenon that has resulted in the world being more connected than ever without actually having true connection. Everything changes at the speed of a mouse click. And churches, churches are struggling to keep up. So in this world, in this world where connection is lacking, but access is easy, how has that shaped our churches? Don't think it hasn't. Churches more than ever doubling down on culture. We're competing for the masses, aren't we? We are competing for 75 minutes a week minimum but we're competing with access in ways that we never before saw. The world tells churches what they think success means, not the other way around. And what does the world think churches need to be successful? You know, multi-million dollar facilities that still maybe aren't big enough. Baptisms weekly, multiple people coming forward to join, having to stream the service into an annex that's also filled, multiple pastors on staff, probably making a livable wage. These things are what the world tells churches they should strive to be, and my goodness, we have tried. In order to please the masses, churches have made messages palatable and easy, opting for a positive, feel-good experience in order to hope that people will return time and time again. It's a struggle. I know that struggle. I see it. And let me assure you, no one is alone. But I wonder, what would it mean and what would it look like to have church and pastoral leadership that looked to this scripture 
as its model. It's going to be a little bit of a challenge. But dream with me just a little bit. Dream with me of what that would mean. And these things are going to grate a little bit, but maybe it would mean that we're measuring success based on transformed lives and true connection rather than our attendance numbers weekly or the number of people joining. It might mean letting go of that building that we're struggling to afford. And what would that mean? It might mean showing that the holy exists outside of our stained glass windows, that the holy exists in the world. It might mean reimagining our church budgets, placing emphasis in places outside of our doors, first and foremost. The biggest struggle I hear from churches and the biggest question I get asked, probably because I'm technically, technically a millennial, barely. <laughs> Where are the young people? What happened to these generations? Well, if I'm barely a millennial, and I've watched society change from landlines to cell phones, to dial up internet, to it being accessible in our hands. What does that mean for a generation that has spent their entire life on this earth in that world? An entire generation that is more connected than ever without true connection. When you put a generation that has experienced life in that way and only that way, in contact with a church that is providing an experience rather than a transformation. No wonder they're not coming. They can get an experience on YouTube. But maybe that hunger that they long for is in the true connection. That is what we seek to provide. So it's not just churches that need to let go of the world's expectations around them. We as leaders are going to have to do the same. Because who's going to lead this way? They're looking at them. All of us are doing this for a church, for an entity, for a transformation in this world. Churches are closing their doors left and right. The time is now. The time is now to quit worshiping Jesus and start following Jesus. It's now. That means, friends, bravery. That means a willingness to stand in front of people and name the sin of racism every single week. That means preaching that sermon about addiction so that the addict in the back row, living in secret shame, sees the holy alongside their struggle. It means saying out loud that domestic violence and sexual assault is not okay and that scriptures used to promote it are not in existence. It means bravery. It means a willingness to make people a little uncomfortable because what life transformation happens without a grieving process? And we as leaders should be with people in their grief as their lives are transformed into something new. Bravery. And a willingness to be crucified, not just weekly, but daily. 
Kurt read from the inclusive Bible, many of you know this scripture is saying, take up your cross. So, take it up. This isn't going to happen overnight. This is a marathon. We're in it for the long haul. But change is necessary. Change is vital and change is needed now more than ever. We will transform lives, walk with people as they journey and change. We will let go of our dependence on culture. Let it go. And maybe, just maybe, in the process of letting it go, in the process of losing our life in it, we will find it again. Amen.